I'm excited to be with you guys this morning if I hadn't had the pleasure of meeting you yet. My name is Matt. I'm the associate pastor here at the West Campus. Glad to see all of you this morning and excited to share with you uh, from God's word this morning. It is Sunday, the first Sunday in December, which means we begin the season of Advent, the season of the church where we all begin to prepare our hearts over the next coming weeks uh, for the celebration of Christmas and the birth of Jesus. We're also in the middle of a sermon series called The Great Eight. And what we're doing in the series is basically each preacher is getting a chance to pick a passage from the text that means a lot to them personally, but then also uh, is one of the kind of quintessential passages from the New Testament that uh, that they feel like the rest of the church should be familiar with. And so they came to me and said, well, Matt, you're preaching on December 2nd. What do you want to preach on? And I said, "Uh, well, this is my first sermon at Christ Chapel ever in front of the West Campus for the first time ever. It's the first Sunday of Advent, Christmas, Jesus, I I don't know, uh, what do I do? What do I pick? And as I was looking at it, as I thought about it, I thought Philippians 2 just checked all the boxes for me. So that's where we're going to be today in the text. If you want to turn the uh, the blue Bibles that are in the chairs in front of you, it's page 980 there, but we'll be in Philippians chapter 2 this morning. And as you're turning there, I want to tell you about something that I thought was really interesting I read this week. It was a statistic that said that every year people estimate that $130 billion is spent on gift cards. You know, we have 23 more days of shopping until Christmas, 23 days to buy some gift cards, $130 billion, okay? And at the end of any given year, it's estimated that still $1 billion of that 130 goes unspent, It expires somewhere in a junk drawer or in a wallet, and you're like, oh, I gotta throw it out. It goes unspent and wasted, okay? And I say that because as I I was thinking about our time together this morning, I was thinking, you know, Christmas itself, the birth of Jesus, is such an indescribable gift to us. I don't want it to be something that goes unspent in our lives. I don't want it to be something where we gather together and remember a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago and go, oh, that's nice. I'm glad that that happened, but that it's something that means something to us today, right now, that affects us tomorrow when we're at the office or in our homes. And so it just makes me think about how everything that revolves around Christmas is really, really, um, is kind of not spiritual for me. I mean, the season tends to kind of sneak up on us, doesn't it? Every year somebody says, wow, Christmas is a lot sooner than it was uh, that I thought. It just snuck up on me this year, you know? Uh, The kids uh, are getting sick. We just had the strep throat monster at our house uh, last week, and we survived and only devoured one of us, thankfully. So But it was like, invariably, right before we're about to travel, somebody gets sick, you know, and then you go to the airport and you want to fly somewhere. And of course, that place, there's no joy in an airport. You know, I I don't know, you know, Buddy the Elf needs to go hang out at the airport to spread some Christmas cheer in that place because it's not a happy place. And so what I'm hoping together is that our time in the text will be a chance for us to whatever noise is in your life, whatever's going on, whatever's kind of um, uh, screaming at you that distracts you from Uh, the reality that is Christmas. I hope we can drown that out, that we can focus our hearts and our minds on the person of Jesus this morning in hopes that Christmas isn't just a time that's busy, but it's a time that's spiritual. It's a time that does something to us that affects us as as followers of Christ. So as we're going to look at Philippians 2, I want you to understand three things this morning, okay? So if you want to take a nap for the next few minutes, listen to these three things, and you can nod off. It's totally fine. You won't offend me. I want to tell you guys that the birth of Christ gives us the mind of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ. That's my point this morning. The birth of Christ gives us the mind of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ. The letter that Paul writes to the Philippians is a very, really interesting letter. Um, The Philippian church was one that was started by Paul. He He was instrumental in its beginning. And then after he moved on and preached the gospel elsewhere, he was eventually arrested. And the believers in Philippi were so concerned about Paul that they wrote him a letter. They were concerned about him. They were concerned about the gospel ministry. And the letter that you have here from Philippians is Paul's letter back to them. He is in prison, arrested for the crime of preaching Jesus. And he's writing them back saying, guys, it's okay. It's fine. I'm still going to preach the gospel. Even to these guys that are chained to me, they're going to hear about it. And the gospel is not in danger. And he uses his imprisonment for the sake of Christ to be an example to the Philippians. He holds up Jesus to them. And he says, look, where you are, where you're living, this is who you need to look like. 
This is who you need to look like for the gospel of Jesus to be proclaimed in your midst. And that's where we're going to pick up in Philippians chapter 2 this morning. I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm actually going to preach the text backwards. So I'm going to turn around and preach it to you. I'm just kidding. I'm a dad. I have to tell a dad joke in here somewhere. I'm actually going to start in verses 6 through 8, and I'm going to, then I'm going to talk about verse 5, and then I'm going to talk about verses 1 through 4. And I think as we go through, you'll see why I'd like to do that. So let's read together, starting in verse 6, where it talks about Jesus. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul begins holding up this picture of Jesus to us. And the first thing that he does in his description is he wants to make sure that they understand that Jesus is God, that he is divine, that he is, has been, and always will be God. That's why he says he was in the form of God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. When he says that he was in the form of God, he's not talking about what Jesus looks like. He's not talking about his appearance. He's talking about Jesus's essential nature, what he's like, who he is, his his personality, and all of what makes him who he is. Um, it's, It's really interesting to me because the way Paul puts this to us, makes this astounding, okay? So when we talk about the birth of Christ, we need to understand, first of all, that the birth of Christ is astounding. And here's why. Because Jesus is going to be, he's going to describe Jesus as God, the highest of the high, exalted above all, highest above everything, sovereign, Lord, okay? And what he's about to do is he's about to describe that Jesus as God to take a descent lower and lower and lower. Look at how Oswald Chambers says it here in this quote. He says, Jesus Christ was born into this world, not from it. He didn't emerge out of history. He came into history from the outside. Jesus Christ is not the best human being the human race can boast of. He is a being for whom the human race can take no credit at all. He is not man becoming God. He is God incarnate. God coming into human flesh from outside it. He, his life is the highest and the holiest, entering through the most humble of doors. Our Lord's birth was an advent, the appearance of God in human form. What's astounding is that God, high and exalted, is going to stoop lower and lower and lower so that he can serve and serve and serve. And what's astounding about that is that not, that's not what gods do. Gods don't come down from on high so they can serve their creation. People don't even do that. We want to climb the ladder and get to the top. And once we get to the top, we want to stay there. We don't want to give it up. We have to hang on to it desperately. It's astounding to me that Jesus, being fully God and who he is, wants to come down to be with us. So the birth of Christ is astounding. Second of all, the birth of Christ is mysterious. Look what Paul says next in verse 7. He was in the form of God. He didn't account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Now, these two words have uh, killed a lot of trees in the theological community. A lot of books have been written about these two words. And I want to tell you, it's, it's a little confusing because it's a little mysterious. We don't understand exactly how it works. But when, when Paul says that Jesus emptied himself, I don't think he's trying to suggest that Jesus emptied himself by some form of subtraction. That he said, okay, I'm going to take this part of my God nature and put it over here, or I'm just going to subdue some of my powers and not use them. I think in this case, it's really more um, an emptying through addition, not subtraction. I know he's like, Matt, that's kooky math. That's not how math works. Uh, I know. I was an English major, but I still know that one, okay? I get it. Except for Jesus. Jesus. Because when you're God and highest above all things, adding human nature to yourself isn't exactly a step up. It's a step down. OK? 
okay? It's mysterious. So somehow, some way, mysteriously, Jesus becomes this, this God-man. Not 50% God, 50% man, but 100% fully God, 100% fully man, dwelling together. He becomes like the one he intends to save. He becomes like us so that he can save us. He comes to serve. Look how, listen to how Charles Spurgeon describes the mystery of the incarnation. He says, infinite and yet an infant. We're going to stop right there. Infinite and yet an infant. Eternal and yet born of a woman. Supporting a universe and yet needing to be carried in a mother's arms. King of angels and yet the reputed son of Joseph, heir of all things and yet the carpenter's despised son. Thomas Watson has even said that the God who thunders in the heavens should cry in the cradle. It's an amazing picture of the mystery that is the incarnation of Jesus because it's really low for a God to descend But Jesus doesn't stop there. He doesn't just take on humanity. He gets even lower. Paul says next, he takes the form of a servant. And the word here is interesting because in the Roman world, in the first century, being a servant was the lowest class of citizen. And what's more than that, the word that he uses here for servant is the same word that Paul uses of himself when he describes himself as a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And a person who is a bond slave is one who had the right to earn their freedom. In the first century Rome, after a period of time, and if you had enough money, you could buy your way out of servitude. But there were a select few that chose instead to not give up their freedom, but instead to stay loyal to their master, to remain their servant. That's the word that Paul uses here when it says that he took the form of a servant. He didn't just become a human he became the lowest kind of human. It's astounding. It's mysterious. And it's also humiliating. It's astounding. It's mysterious. And the birth of Christ is humiliating. Think about this. Jesus, fully God, leaves behind his entitlements as God, takes on humanity to his nature, becomes the lowest kind of human, and submits himself to death by human hands, humans he created. And he doesn't just submit himself to death, he submits himself to the worst kind of death imaginable, the most humiliating kind of death, death on a cross. First century Rome, crucifixion was the most abhorrent form of death known to man. In fact, if you were a Roman citizen, you were um, exempt from crucifixion because it was thought so humiliating. Only the worst of the worst non-Romans were crucified. The God of creation stoops down and and humiliates himself lower and lower and lower so that he can serve us. What kind of God does something like this? And why would he do something like this? He humiliates himself from heaven all the way to death on a cross without any incentive. There was nothing in it for him. He gave up everything and he didn't owe anyone anything. He did it for us. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it because he loves us. Because love gets low. Love is humble. And love wants to serve. Because as sinners, we cannot enjoy life the way God meant for it to be lived unless we are born again from above. He became like us so that we could be born again. And when Jesus comes and is born in Bethlehem, that makes our spiritual birth possible. It makes it possible for us to have life the way God intended for it to be lived, life the way that he wants it to be. And if we accept him as Savior and Lord in our lives, our lives then become like a Bethlehem for the Son of God, where he can come into us and be born again, and his life can become incarnated in our own. 
So the amazing thing about, or the great thing about Advent is that it's about the birth of Christ. The second great thing about Advent is that the birth of Christ doesn't just save us from our sins, it also gives us his mind. Look here in verse five. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, yours in Christ Jesus. The word mind here can make us think a lot of different things. I don't think it means that we have Jesus' thoughts, like he's telling us what to think, as much as I think that as Paul um, describes the humiliation of Christ and the incarnation, what he's doing, he's, he's holding up Jesus, not so that we just see what he did, but that we understand the attitude that possessed him to do what he did. That's what the mind of Christ is. It's an attitude. It's a nature uh, that motivated him to humiliate himself for us. He holds up this attitude, not as one that should, that should just be admired. He holds up the attitude of Christ so that we might adopt it into our own lives. That's why he says, it's ours in Christ, meaning it's, it's not something that we need to acquire. It's not something that we need to uh, go and get. We've received it like a gift, and we've received it because we've seen the picture of Christ in the incarnation. It's right there in front of us. And so as we look at verses six through eight and we think about the mind of Christ, we have to ask ourselves, what is it? What is it like? And I think it's three things. First, I think his attitude is one of humility. His attitude is one of humility. In our family, we're trying our best right now to teach our kids how to learn some character qualities that are in Jesus. And one of the character qualities we're trying to teach them is the character quality of humility. And so we've come up with some mottos that help teach them uh, how to kind of memorize the quality of humility. And for humility, we have this motto. Know yourself well, think of yourself less, so you can serve others more. That's our motto for humility. We want our kids to know themselves well. We don't want them to think too highly of themselves. We don't want them to think too lowly of themselves. We want them to be so secure in who they are that they're not obsessed with themselves. And when they're not obsessed with themselves, they think of themselves less. They don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. And when you think about yourself less, who do you see? Other people. And so you can serve them. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He knows who he is. He didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And because he wasn't insecure about his position as God, he was able to think of himself less so that he could serve us more. The attitude of Christ is one of humility. It's also an attitude of service. I've heard it said that if you want to know whether or not you have a servant's heart, then you should watch how you react when you're treated like one, and that will show you. You know, Jesus surrendered his position and power to serve us and he was treated like a criminal for it. But Jesus didn't protest. He didn't retaliate. Because when you're a servant, you're not interested in how you're treated. The only thing you're focused on is the one you want to serve. And finally, his attitude was one of submission. Repeatedly throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus say something like, I came not to do my own will, but to do the will of the Father who sent me. And when Jesus was in the garden, just before he was crucified, he said, not my will, but yours be done. Because for Jesus, obedience and submission to God the Father was more important than his personal comfort. It was more important than his reputation. It was more important than even his very life. This mind of Christ, Paul holds it up to, to us and we see his humility. We see his service. We see his submission. It's right there in front of us. It's ours. And the question now is, what are we going to do with it? We see the example of Christ in his incarnation. But what are we going to do with this mind if it's ours? That's what I want to talk about here in the last section of verses 1 through 4. And this is the third reason I think that Advent is so great. Look in verses one through four. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That, my friends, is what the mind of Christ looks like when it's fleshed out in us. Or can I say, when it's incarnated in us. That's what it should look like. And when each of us has the mind of Christ, it does something to all of us, too. The birth of Christ gives us the mind of Christ so that together we can be the body of Christ. It does two things to us. First, it unites us in who we are. It unites us in who we are because if you come here and you're a follower of Christ and you believe that the exalted God above heaven and earth, the creator of all things and in whom all things hold together, if you have declared that he is your Lord and you have come to gather here in this place to worship his name this morning, then these things about us are true, that we are those who find strength and hope and encouragement in the reality of our faith in Christ. We are those who experience the comfort that only God can provide for us because he is the one that is the sovereign over all. We are those in this room who enjoy the indwelling influence of the Holy Spirit as we learn how to live out the life of Christ in our own lives. And we are those who have tasted the grace and the mercy of the fellowship of brothers and sisters near and dear to us in this room. When the mind of Christ fleshes itself out in each of us, it makes us recognizable. Not just as people who belong to Jesus, but also as people who belong to the fellowship that is Christ's chapel. When when we live out the mind of Christ, it doesn't just do something to each of us as individuals, it unites us together in who we are. But it doesn't just unite us in what we believe and what we enjoy. It also unites us in what we do. We are united in what we're doing here. We're on the same team. So this fellowship isn't one where we compete with one another. Instead, we look out for each other. We help each other when we have need. Instead of seeking our own glory, we look for ways to make other people look great. Instead of walling ourselves off in isolation, We invite others in so that we can be known and we can know others. And if we're members of the same team, then that means we have the same goal together, that we want to worship God, we want to become like him, and we want everybody else that knows us to know him as well, that we would live our lives in such a way that manifests the glory of God to others so that they would recognize and know Jesus and enjoy him the way that we have. And in fact, that's the context of Philippians 2. If you go back into Philippians chapter 1, that's what Paul's talking about. That's what prompts him to hold up Jesus as this example is because of his concern for the preaching of the gospel, not just by words, but by resemblance. Look at what he says in Philippians 1, 27. Only let your manner of life and by the way there, the word, the word your is, we could say y'all. He's not saying you singular. He's saying all of you all. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, here's the cool thing. Each one of us in here is incredibly different. And some of us know each other really well, and some of us don't. Some of us like certain types of music. Some of us like other types of music. Some of us like to worship this way or that way, study this passage or that passage. Some of us are gifted at speaking. Some of us are gifted at serving. But here's the thing. When we appreciate the birth of Jesus in the Advent, and we appropriate his mind so that it becomes ours and we trade our attitudes and our sinful tendencies for the selfless, sacrificial, and humble mind of Jesus and we are united together. Do you know what happens? When we, when we live and function in Parker County as his church, do you, know what, do you know what happens? It's almost like Jesus never left. When you serve with the gifts God's given you, 
when you serve with the gifts God's given you, when you serve with the gifts God's given you, as I serve with the gifts God has given me, we together, one body, many parts, function together. And our presence in Parker County is the physical manifestation of Christ on the earth. It's another incarnation of Jesus. He's in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, and he prays for us. And we're here representing him with our words and with our works. And as we do that, as we uh, resemble him in our attitudes and in our minds, God continues to be glorified. That's what makes Advent so great. The birth of Christ gives us the mind of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ. So in this season of Christmas, I want us to think practically here. What does this mean for me when I go to Aunt Susie's house and I have to eat her fruitcake? Because I don't like fruitcake, right? What does the attitude of Christ look like over the next couple of weeks as I'm trying to finish up a bunch of stuff at work so I can get out of town on vacation? What does it look like to have the mind of Christ in the everyday? Three things. I think this is the season to trade our ambition for self-forgetfulness. To trade our ambition for self-forgetfulness. Let me be real practical. Instead of trying to win an argument, listen instead. Instead of trying to be the best, be wowed by someone else. Instead of trying to control all of the outcomes, trust God for a change. It's also the season for us to trade our selfishness for service. Instead of giving so that you can get, just give. Don't expect anything in return. Give freely, no incentive, just give. Instead of letting other people do the work that you know that you should be doing, beat them to it. Be the first one to serve. Instead of ignoring people that you don't like, share a meal with them. Get to know what they like instead. The mind of Christ reminds us that other people don't exist for us. We exist for them. And we don't need to prove ourselves because we're secure in who we are in Jesus. And it is the season to trade our individualism for community. You know, if you, got, if you still haven't hung your Christmas lights yet, instead of doing it yourself, invite somebody to do it with you. Maybe not. <laughs> instead of suffering alone, Instead of taking all of your troubles and all of your pain, invite somebody else in. Share your burdens. I think you'll be surprised at the result. Instead of being defensive when someone criticizes you about something, or instead of thinking that you can't be a part, apologize, join in, don't wait for an invitation, participate. Because the mind of Christ makes it possible for us to trust somebody else instead of only trusting in ourselves. Friends, the more that Christ is born in us together, the more that other people get to see him lifted up. When you live out the mind of Christ in your everyday, when you live out the mind of Christ in your everyday, it takes Jesus from his position of humility, where he humbled himself to the point of obedience and death on a cross and exalts him all the way back to where he began, where he is Lord of all, over all, through all, and in all. We can do exactly what Paul says and how he concludes in verses nine through 11. Read it. It says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ Chapel, that is our call to worship. 
That right there, that is what can drown out the noise of the commercialism of the holiday that, that surrounds us. That's what can make sure that the gift of the incarnation to us doesn't go unspent tomorrow or next Thursday. It's this is what happens when we trade our attitudes for the attitude of Christ that we lift him up as God has lifted him up and we praise him to be the Lord exalted over all because that's what he deserves for what he did at Christmas. Amen? Amen. We got to sing. Drew, get out here, man. We got to sing. I can't, I mean, I'll pray, but man, we got to sing about this. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we are humbled by your humility. And we marvel at the way that you chose to give us your son. We are grateful, Father, for all that you've done for us in Jesus. And we ask simply, Father, that you would give us in full measure, that you would remind us of the mind of Christ, that we could be humble, that we could serve, that we can be submissive, that we can be one. And in doing those things, Father, glorify the Son who sacrificed everything so that we could be born again. May that incarnation, Father, happen in our lives this Christmas season. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.